Hi listeners, Lucy here. Uh, Please don't fast forward. I have a very quick message to ask a very easy favour. At the end of each full audio episode, you'll hear us request a rating and a review. Now for those of you that are awesome YouTube watchers rather than YouTube content makers, you might have no idea what a huge difference those things actually make. A significant factor in the visibility of YouTube videos on the platform is down to the quantity and quality of ratings and subscriptions. So if you are one of our dedicated watchers or listeners, I hear there are some of you as far away as Australia, so thanks. If you are not currently driving a car or changing a baby's nappy, please look at your screen right now and click subscribe and give this video a little thumbs up. Both of them are just a one click job, but oh my God, what a huge difference that one click will make. Now enjoy the video and this latest guest is awesome. You're about to hear a brief conversation with an incredible artist. Part autobiographical journey, part literary analysis, and part late night chat in the theatre bar. This is Hear Me Out. And I'm your host, Lucy Eaton. Please welcome to the stage, Patsy Farron. Christmas anxiety has already begun to set in. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is, oh my gosh, I only have six weeks to buy the presents. Mm. And actually the package I'm waiting for is a wooden Christmas tree. Because we've decided we're going to stop buying actual plants. Very eco? Yeah. Trying to be better for the environment and all of that. So that is, if the doorbell does go, that's, that's, it's a wooden that's Christmas my tree. Christmas tree. How is... Uh, life as a creative? It's, I've been quite lucky this year. Um, Sadly, no theatre. This is the first year for me where I've not done any theatre and I'm beginning to get withdrawal symptoms. Even though theatre generally does scare me, I am not a relaxed theatre performer. And are you not scared on a filming set? No. That's interesting. What do you think it is? Um... I think the live aspect is complete. I mean, you do have the crew there, but as with anything, you give it time, you just get used to everything and suddenly it feels like you might be acting in your living room, kind of. Mm. Unless you're dealing with a director who loves a chaotic process, which I have had that experience a few times. And that's quite anxiety inducing. I know it's good for me. I know that sort of thing is good what for me. What do you mean by a chaotic process? Like what, what aspects are chaotic? Um, you just know you're going to turn up and the scene's going to be completely different. The lines that you were given like three months ago will now not be the scene anymore. And you are required as a film actor to be quick at, be good at learning lines in a short period of time. Yeah. Luckily for me, I've got quite good short term memory. My long-term memory is appalling. Mine is as well. I think back to plays that I did now or speeches I had in those plays and I'm like, I don't even remember what the first line was. And I did that every night for like three months. So can I admit something now? (laughs) Please. Yesterday, yesterday I um, had to Wikipedia. (laughs) I had to Wikipedia the play that we're talking about today (laughs) because I was like... If Lucy asks me what this play is about, I'll be like, oh. I'm going to ask you what the play is about. I know. Don't worry. I've done, I've, I've, I did some, you did some, yesterday. you did some research. <laughs> <laughs> and I did that play twice over like a long period of time each time. It's, cr- and you know, anyway. But maybe also to be fair, something like Summer and Smoke, and we'll get on to it now. Mm-hmm. Something like Summer and Smoke, it's like, it is both about stuff and also not about exactly. stuff. Exactly. That's exactly right. And even doing the play, mm. I think we might be jumping the gun a bit here, but even just do it quickly saying, just doing the play, mm. I remember sometimes when we did a show, we would we couldn't quite hook into it because it's so, like, amorphous. Ethereal. Like, you can't... Yeah, ethereal. You can't quite... Um, so even then, describing the play, it's, it's kind of the same experience you're trying to hook into what it's about and I'm like it's about lots of things I'm going to use my red pen here to make a note that I would like to come back to that (laughs) (laughs) and then I would like you to see if you can vaguely tell our listener what it's about no I will I I think I've got what did you land on (laughs) (laughs) this is sorry we should say this is summer and smoke by Tennessee Williams (laughs) that's the one an obvious choice but Hence my long-term memory. I was like, 
I don't think I've done any other plays. That's the only play I've ever done. No, um... Well, I mean, you have you have done so much and in so many amazing theatres. And I never normally do this at the beginning of an episode. And I'm wondering whether I should start to intro people because the guests that I get on, because I've chosen to get them on, they're obviously people that I enormously respect and know a lot about their work. Right. And so I'm like, everybody should know what Patsy <laughs> Farron has done. Like Everybody should know what Denise Goff has done. Everybody. Whereas actually, yeah. of course, there are some listeners who... I don't know, maybe they don't live in England. Maybe they yeah. just have stumbled across this for some other reason. They're not massive theatre buffs. And right. I need to get a bit better at... Context. Giving some context. Yeah, so context, as a little yeah. context, a, a tiny bit of context of you, Patsy, in case yes. you didn't remember this, <laughs> Patsy is an exceptional theatre actress and now screen actress also, who has performed at almost every single one of the theatres I love most in London. And most notably, won an Olivier Award for Best Actress in her performance of <laughs> Alma in Summer and Smoke by Tennessee Williams. Wow. And Patsy, what speech are you going to discuss today? Summer and Smoke by Tennessee Williams. Yay. There you go. So that's why it maybe to us seemed like an obvious choice, but I'm so glad you picked it. I, it, I sort of was a no-brainer because actually the monologue I will be reading later, I have one of the most... Um, visceral memories of there was a particular show where so, there was just so many outside factors happening. I did the speech in a completely different way to how I'd rehearsed it. And it had unlocked a lot of things for me as an actor going forward. That's super interesting. Okay, so go on. So vaguely, what's the play about? What is Summer and okay. about? The nutshell is, it's a will they, won't they love story. Perfect. That's the nutshell. But the play follows a young woman called Alma, mm -hmm. who's the daughter of a preacher. And uh, she lives next door to uh, the son of a doctor called John. And it follows her lifelong... Now, these words, it could you could say love, fixation, obsession, infatuation with this boy next door. But then at the, 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 the main uh, development of the play is this year where John returns from having studied as a doctor at university and it follows this year where the, where the two of them meet and miss, and miss each other over a year and sort of explore each other's, what's the word, like ideologies. Because they have completely different worldviews. She comes from a spiritual background, he comes from a scientific background and it's sort of there. They come to blows a little bit, um, trying to understand each other. Do you have any idea why? So it wasn't massively well received when it was first, not your production, that was yeah, very yeah, well received, yeah. but when it was first done, right? it came off the back of, am I right, Streetcar Named Desire? Uh, as I understand it, I think he wrote it before and after Streetcar. So it was sort of like this ongoing thing, but he finished it after Streetcar. Oh. Yeah, it was interesting because when we first rehearsed it at the Almeida, I remember asking Rebecca Frecknell, the, the director, um, and I, we already all knew that historically this play didn't do very well. Um, <laughs> like, You're like, why are we in, doing this? <laughs> why are we doing this? But in the rehearsal room, it felt... Um, easy's not the right word, but things just made sense. And looking back, I think it's because that play was married with the perfect director because of Rebecca. Mm -hmm. She got to unlock the things that, and like, as we've established before, the play itself is quite hard to hook into. So one wrong move and you've lost it kind of thing. Uh, and then you have a director who completely understood this play to its core. And so I, in rehearsals, it felt like it made sense. But I knew that, I think I was convinced that I'd, I was missing something. I was missing the floor. Right. I remember asking her, like, why does this feel so good, knowing, though, that historically this doesn't do well? Like, what's... What am I missing? She's like, I don't know. We, we, we sort of went into it, like, I think, it, I think it, we benefited from, like, the historically poor reviews that this play has received mm -mm. because I think expectations But also, I went to see it 
And I didn't, when I went to see it, I didn't know that it had been reviewed badly before. I was just like, oh, Tennessee Williams play. Um, yeah. And I did love it. So there were a lot of us not going in. I do think also it wasn't just expectations versus reality. Yeah. It was, as you say, that perfect combination of a director, a cast, a theatre. Yes. It was just like the perfect blend. And I think it's really interesting when you say about Rebecca Frecknell being the perfect match for it because... I think that happened with, so my brother, Simon Evans, who's a theatre director, he did a play called The Dazzle by Richard Greenberg. And that is a similar thing. It was absolutely panned on Broadway when it first got written. Yeah. And he kept reading it being like, I don't understand how this was panned because this is, this is amazing. And I don't know what they did wrong, but like, this is amazing. And when he was trying to get it put on, he got a lot of resistance because I think so many people were looking at what it was on Broadway and going like, this seems like a risk. This seems like a deeply flawed play. And absolutely, like you say with Rebecca Frecknell, he was the perfect director for that play. And he got the perfect cast. And it was like, Andrew Scott and David Dawson and Joanna Vanderham and they were the perfect people to play the parts. Oh and it my was, gosh, I remember this. And it got like five star reviews all across the board oh, and audiences wow. absolutely loved it. And yes. I think that's really true. Sometimes you can pair the wrong play and director and then the whole thing falls apart and it's not necessarily because the director is good or bad. It's like plays are little like living things. Yes. And they need to be paired with the right like leader. Right. And also timing, I would say, Um, because I also remember Rebecca saying in rehearsals that um, even though it's of its time, there is something there's a real contemporary feel to it. Mm. When you have a lead female character who suffers from anxiety, a young person, what was the what she said? She said like a young person who's dealing with isolation and societal pressure. And I think that's something that we can all understand today particularly I like that you did it I'm going through a bit of a phase at the moment of I'm sick of the word relatable (laughs) I just feel like every every time I see a play come out do you know what I mean every time something gets announced everyone's like it's just so relatable right now wait there's but there's loads relatable go on um Deals with the human condition, <laughs> the, the the journey of the character. Of course, yeah. Uh, the craft. But deals with the human condition. That is a corker. Oh my god, all the time. And the annoying thing is, a lot of things are relatable. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's great that they're relatable. But I feel like it's become the thing that everyone thinks is going to draw audiences in. And you're like, yes. can we not just assume? that any play that's being done is being done because people are going to be able to relate to it in some way. Relate to it, and I I hope it deals with the human condition. I will say, (laughs) there's very little theatre, in my my opinion right now, that deals with the human condition. It deals with intellectual debate, but very little deals with... that's interesting. We need a little more human condition. Oh, come on, bring it on. Like, But people use it in order to sell the play, and you're like, but it's not, though, is it? Maybe it's the break. Maybe it's the COVID break, right? But, and I say this on a podcast about theatre that I host and the fact that I love theatre. But I would say with COVID, I had this step away from it. Mm. And there's a few things now that I have less patience with. Now I go back as an audience member that I think Mm -hmm. in the past, I was so in it and I was seeing stuff all the time and I was so Mm -hmm. used to it. And now, and I won't name the play because I believe very strongly in shouting publicly about things that are brilliant but yeah. not not shouting publicly about things that I don't like because why rain on anyone's why, parade? Br- yeah, exactly. I agree with but you. But there was a play that uh, was the first play I saw out of lockdown. I was there yeah. with my family and my husband. I remember turning to them in the interval and being like, it's very theatery. <laughs> it was so theatery. And, and actually, it was going down really well with people. So I was like, I don't think necessarily this is a bad production. I think I've become quite acutely... Uh, sensitive to mm-hmm. um, theateriness, so I think that's also where my pet peeve of the relatability has come from. Is I'm, I'm seeing you. all these promo vids that, of course, when we're in the industry, like we see those vids all the time. Mm-hmm. I just maybe want more people to just be like, it's just really fun night out. <laughs> yes, and also the thing I crave when I go to the theater, and this is the word I'm going to steal from a, uh, a director friend called Guy Jones. Mm. He just like it's. The alchemy. I just want to see alchemy on stage. I sometimes don't actually care what the what the overarching like 
players about. I just want to see two or three or four people interact with each other and I'm engaged and I'm invested and I want to it's hard as as actors it's difficult to dis, to sort of switch off that critical eye of do I believe that moment and the moment I s sniff ego or <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm so sorry no go on I'm exposing myself but like bad technique like just basically going so I can't quite this is my own thing though mm. when actors are facing the audience but having a conversation with another person I'm like I can just look at your acting partner, please. Like, and then I also am aware that there are plenty of, and I'm sort of envious of these audience members who that just sort of thing is not important to them. They just will, they're just happy to listen to the whole thing and enjoy it for what I, it so is. So I remember when I first got together with my now husband, and he is an deeply creative man and deeply talented musician, writer. Like he does all sorts of things, but it's not his career. Mm -hmm. And I remember him saying to me you can never have a bad night at the National. And again, I'm saying this as a person who bloody loves the National. Yeah. But I was like, oh, babe, <laughs> you can have a bad night anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right, Patsy. Right. So we've talked a little about Summer and Smoke. Can you now explain what the speeches you've picked, right. where in the story that takes place? So this monologue, this moment, comes towards essentially almost the end of the play where Alma's just gone through a health scare. She basically has a, I would say, a nervous breakdown and has sort of been in hiding for the past few months. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just finds out that um, John, the love of her life, is potentially engaged to another woman. And she... How old is she? 25. Right. So she's not like a sort of... We're not talking Romeo and Juliet. She's not... No. 13 and... Mm -mm. She's a grown woman. She ought to know better. <laughs> yes, she does. Yes, she ought to know better. She ought to know better. Okay. But I think she realises that she's running out of time to fully confess her feelings for John. So although she's doing something destructive, I do think it's a very brave, vulnerable, beautifully written bit of... Um, What's the word? I like love confessing. And when you said, you said right at the beginning, yeah. you said this really interesting thing about there being this one performance where you did it differently. I really want to hear more about that. But before hearing that, I'd love to know, like, do you have any memories of how you approached it at first? So uh, my dodgy memory tells me <laughs> that um, I remember um, it being left alone quite a bit. It's so well written. It's so exquisitely written that you almost just have to say it and it works. There's very little like mining you have to do. Good word. I do remember learning it for the first time properly. I have a vivid memory of being on my bed mm. and I had a playlist. It's the only character I've ever created a playlist for and it still exists on my phone. And whenever I experience music, that's very... Uh, melancholy if there's any longing and melancholia in it then it goes straight onto this playlist yeah and I remember always uh, learning lines with a soundtrack sometimes already unlocks things as you're learning it I find I love that I'm gonna steal yeah. that yeah and to ask the question that we all hate to be asked but actually it feels relevant here I'm scared how do you learn your lines <laughs> <laughs> oh Repetition. So do you literally say it out loud again and again and again? I I do have a very specific way of learning, which is uh, uniting it. So I it's not just one big, like, intimidating block of words. And, and then, explain to the listener who might not know what uniting is. Oh, unit is when there's natural breaks in the in the scene where there's like a change in thought or a change in subject or whatever and so you you split the text up into sections basically and then I take one section at a time and I say it out loud and I will probably read it without taking my eye off the page five times because I'm a visual learner so I can so the words I can see what which words have been used to convey the meaning and then sometimes I'll go, f I try and learn the thought first before 
really seeing what the individual words are, but it's repetition and words out loud. I definitely find, you know, people always say this, but it's very hard if you're ever in a production where people want you to arrive off book because it's the process of rehearsing that makes it go in incredibly naturally. And I yet... might have to contradict that a little bit. Oh, go on. I'm so sorry, but I'm going Get to Get off my podcast. <laughs> no one is allowed to disagree with me <laughs> on my podcast. I understand, I understand the, the, um, the argument of I can't learn lines until I've rehearsed it. But I myself can't rehearse anything freely until I know what my th- where I'm going in the yes, scene. Yes, it is much easier as well. Also, just to not have that thing in your hand. Yeah, I can't play. I can't play around if I'm like doing this, like looking. You know, when you do a self tape, yes. do you learn your lines or do you stick them? I learn my lines. Oh, I haven't. I am so as we've established. Get off I am again. So... Get off my podcast. <laughs> But people have these amazing apps where you've got the script like scrolling. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I'm definitely more old fashioned. I just like stick them where I want to put the other person. Yeah. Do you know what? I don't know why I don't do that. I should just do that. I used to be, I used to like be really hard on myself if I got one word wrong. And my partner was the one who taught me like, it doesn't, they're probably going to change this line on the day, which has been my experience. It's just like, just riff around it, like be free around it. Cause I'm such a rule follower. Having him in like learning from him, it's like sometimes it's okay, especially with film and self tapes, you can just play around with it. It doesn't yeah. have to be perfect. And so then I've, I've started to enjoy self tapes because of that. They're hard to enjoy sometimes. Oh yeah. Um, okay, back to Summer and Smoke. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So yes. tell us about this show that you have in your memory where you said you did it differently. So um, it was during the West End run. Mm. And I remember, I think it was around the time where I got quite ill. Like I had a really bad flu. And I just remember like drinking cups and cups of like this throat comfort tea because I had like my I'd, like sandpaper for, for a throat and... I was just physically and mentally exhausted. Like the tank was low. Yeah. <laughs> and it got to a point where usually Dr. Theatre kicks in and just you find these sort of reserves and you can just get through the show with um, a decent amount of energy. And then suddenly I was just looking at Matt Needham. <laughs> who was, <laughs> was playing just John. Like, who, who was playing John. Mm. And I was just like, I just don't have anything left in me. And I'm quite a uh, express, physically expressive person. I have been told before, even like you need to tone the arm gestures down. But that is just that is how I communicate as a human being, anyway. But I do know that I need to have control over this. Mm. And I just remember feeling a weight in my body. I was completely and utterly still. My body was just like sagging with with tiredness, and I just did the entire speech at this very um what i would say the most pure version of the 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 speech because it was just i wasn't forcing anything it was just like this is how i'm truly feeling in the moment and this is how it's coming up and i can't do anything about it and i suddenly went oh my god like body relaxation i realized unlocks so much i mean it was um rebecca the director was on me when it came to my body tension because the character herself suffers from anxiety and she is a ball. She's highly strung. Yeah, yeah. And and Rebecca works outside in. She's a trained dancer and has been a movement director in the past. And so she would just like make your body physically tense the entire time, and that's how. And then just see what happens. And whenever there was a show where I was slightly more relaxed. She was on me and was yeah. like, no, 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 keep. And that was exhausting as well. But there was, it, it was very fitting for the play where you experience almost two and a half hours of her trying to get what she wants, but failing. And she's tired and she's tired of the pretense. She's tired of that societal mask. Mm. And I, and me as the actor was exhausted. And suddenly this monologue came out in a way that I'd never done it before. Even Matt afterwards, who played John, was like, are you okay? Because that was... And I was like, I was just knackered. So, so tired. It taught me that there is no right one right way of doing anything. 
if it's true to how you as the actor are feeling in the moment, it more or less always works. Mm, mm. And I didn't used to trust that. I used to think there was one way of doing it that, that, and that's what you decide in rehearsals and your goal every night is to reach those choices and reach that energy, which meant that 90% of the time I would leave the stage disappointed in my performance. Isn't that <sighs> awful? Because that's impossible. You're contriving a series of um, factors that aren't in your control. And actually, if you go with your own flow, it's an incredibly freeing experience. And, and, and I was like, I've been doing theatre up until that point, five or six years. And I was like, oh, I understand it now. Isn't that crazy? And that's not even including training and doing plays before. I was like, oh, I think I understand what this is supposed to be, what acting is. And I'm going to use the triggering word, you know, your craft. <laughs> that was one of your triggering words. Don't worry. That's not one of my triggering words. You're allowed to say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I... I instantly thought of this monologue when you asked me to do this podcast and I was like, oh yes, and that amazing experience of something unlocking and a penny dropping when it came to just what acting is. Brilliant. Mm. There is one more question I wanted to ask, certainly to do with, certainly this play, if not this speech, which is the Olivier. Oh yeah. You were not expecting to win. No. No. Can you tell me, like, what was the experience? What was the experience like of winning? I have a few questions. What was the experience like of winning? Do you feel pressure to win again as a now an Olivier winner? Do you uh, feel like question. you need to yeah, yeah, do it yeah. again, or are you like, great, ticked that off? Yeah. Don't need to worry about that because I've got the Olivier. And did it change how people dealt with you career-wise after you'd won? Um. Very good questions. I don't. I do not think about it very often. The award itself does exist in my living room, but it has quickly. Um, you know, when something just sort of becomes like white noise, there's like the equivalent <laughs> yeah. of that. I barely register it until I have people round and they'll go, "Oh my god, can I hold it?" And you go, "Yeah, okay, sure, go for it." <laughs> and like myself, I think I've held it maybe four or five times. Like, I don't, it's just sort of... You don't pick it up and just no, stand in front of the mirror. <laughs> no, I don't even... So the, the experience of that evening was one of the scariest nights of my life because it was at the Royal Albert Hall, which is huge, and I was just wishing and willing that I wouldn't win so that I didn't have to get up in front of all of those people and have to form sentences of gratitude, like... I remember whenever whoever won the previous awards, I would be like, oh, I would feel sorry for them that they'd have to go up. Because public speaking <laughs> gives me like the heebie-jeebies and I'm like, I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. I'm not actually a natural, naturally articulate human being. Anyway, under pressure, no way. I remember like, I've, just, I've got traumatic memories of doing public speaking at school like doing competitions we are and... so the opposite i was such a precocious like love public speaking <sighs> my friends just asked if i'll officiate their wedding ceremony and i'm like yes oh my god put me in front of those people no <laughs> i can't and i've done i like and people assume as an actor that you that's something that is your bad. massive it's misconception completely yeah different Kettle yeah, fish. there should be a meme. It's like there's two types of actor, and it would be you and me, Patsy. I'd be there <laughs> constantly, like da da da. <laughs> but I do remember the only time I relaxed when was when they were announcing it, mm. because I was at the very back of the auditorium, placed bang smack in the middle of a row. You were like, I haven't won. I haven't won. I can relax. Because they wouldn't put me here. I can chill out. And this is only happening as they were announcing it. Yeah. And then I remember hearing my name and I was going, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't want to go up. I don't want to go up. But that night, amazing. And then, yeah, so do you feel now great I've done it. Oh, yeah. I don't think I... No, I don't think I thought actually once about, will this job get me a second Olivier nom? Will it? <laughs> no, never. I don't think that way at all. And then whether the industry itself treats me differently. I, I've been told that if I put my name attached to a play, it's more likely to get put on, maybe. Mm. 
but these are things that an agent says to me but that's not that's not my reality whatsoever that's not I'm not privy to those conversations I'm not I'm definitely someone who goes with the flow I think there's definitely an element of especially within the the theatre world that there is some I feel there might be like a quiet confidence within continuing to work within it Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. that is something that that is a thought that I have to work hard to get to because I think as you know with any sort of self-employed creative work you are constantly dealing with that those demons of like will I ever work again because mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. even winning that award um, I'm convinced that people will probably forget because and also because of the nature of the world that we live in everything's so fast paced and yeah sometimes it's a blessing like if you do, if you've got news out into the world that you don't want people to really know about don't worry within the next day you'll be old news so you can just carry on like that's probably a blessing in a way um I think just for within that moment it was nice to get some sort of validation I suppose it's always mm -hmm. nice whether I think it will serve me in the future you just never know obviously yes on paper it, it does but emotionally no <laughs> you're like I might not ever work again. So I'm always convincing myself that just be grateful for this job now and enjoy it. Yeah. On that note. I, st I have to now read it, don't I? Yes. Can you read us the speech, please, Patsy? I'll be very quiet. I will try and be vocal. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, it would be best if you are not quiet. Okay, here we go. I don't want to be talked to like some incurably sick patient you have to comfort. Oh, I suppose I am sick. One of those weak and divided people who slip like shadows among you solid, strong ones. But sometimes, out of necessity, we shadowy people take on a strength of our own. I have that now. You needn't try to deceive me. You needn't try to comfort me. I haven't come here on any but equal terms. You said let's talk truthfully. Well, let's do. Unsparingly truthfully, even shamelessly then. It's no longer a secret that I love you. It never was. I loved you as long ago as the time I asked you to read the stone angel's name with your fingers. Yes, I remember the long afternoons of our childhood when I had to stay indoors to practice my music and heard your playmates calling you. Johnny, Johnny. How it went through me, just to hear your name called, and how I rushed to the window to watch you jump the porch railing, stood at a distance halfway down the block only to keep in sight of your torn red sweater, racing about the vacant lot you played in. Yes, it had begun that early, this affliction of love, and has never let go of me since, but kept on growing. I've lived next door to you all the days of my life, a weak and divided person who stood in adoring awe of your singleness, of your strength. And that is my story. Now I wish you would tell me, why didn't it happen between us? Why did I fail? Why did you come almost close enough and no closer? I had a little, I had a little um, line wobble, but that's oh, okay, Patsy, right? Oh, hush yourself. That was absolutely delightful. Um, I love shadowy people. What is it? We shadowy people take on a strength of our own. Yeah, I know. It's just, she's just amazing. She's just amazing. What's the bit that I, I literally adore? Oh yeah, I wasn't very clear just then, but yes, it had begun that early, this affliction of love, and it has never let go of me since but kept on growing and you're just like oh, goosebumps like oh. she's amazing I would agree with him she's like one of the best characters to exist mm. in theatre I think Patsy thank you so Lucy, much thank you I do know I could chat to you for hours <laughs> I do have multiple other questions but, you know. Hear Me Out is a Lucy Eaton Productions podcast music composed by Tristan Kay and artwork by Rebecca Bright our heartfelt thanks to the estates and license holders that allow us to read our guests' speech choices. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please, please subscribe, rate and review.
You can follow us on social media at Pod Hear Me Out and enjoy visual clips of the interviews on our YouTube channel. Finally, if you would like to support Hear Me Out, go ahead and click the Patreon link at the bottom of the episode bios.